Developing and having trustworthy informational sources are crucial to your success. Coming up, we share where and how to find those resources. That's right, Mandy. And I think one of the biggest expectations before we get too far into this is that we need to learn to manage our expectations. Mandy, what were your expectations? Initially, I didn't have any, but it quickly became apparent as I started collecting birds that there was a lot I didn't know. And there's so much information out there now in addition to some of the historical references that you can go down into a wormhole of information. And some of that's going to help you with your flock as far as your husbandry methods, your breeding methods, nutritional aspects, every angle of the bird, all the way to developing the birds and moving forward in a breeding program. There's a lot to know. So having your goals really helps. And Finding out what information you need to keep them going. And then you can just grow it from there and you'll learn more than you ever thought there was to know. Oh boy, that's for sure. John, what were your expectations starting out in poultry? Well, there was a whole lot I didn't know. I knew that poultry were a very efficient way to feed people a healthy and nutritious diet if they were tended properly. Um, but uh, husbandry methods and raising the birds played such a crucial role in producing a quality bird. And I saw that the way that the commercial industry was going was not the direction that I wanted to be with, you know, Cornish crosses. So I kind of knew that I had an uphill battle to get there, to get a heritage breed to perform acceptably and economically. I think we all had similar backgrounds. I I came into the standard bred poultry hobby from a commercial background. And I quickly realized that there was a world of difference between those two aspects. So I really started with no real expectations for standard bred poultry, partly because of my age. I was, I was still young then. And partly because I knew I didn't know anything. I think the one piece of advice I could give folks is to go into this hobby like you're a sponge wanting to soak up everything, but you got to have really good information filters because there's so much bad information passed around today in internet groups and chat rooms and uh, some of the YouTube videos. Some are good. Some are, are not so good. So you got to be able to, to discern for yourself what's good, what applies to your situation. And even in some instances, farm pages and and websites have bad information on. So just be careful. You know, if you have a problem, you can contact a friend or in the fancy that you trust or shoot, send us an email. We'll help you out. Try to avoid claims that sound too good to be true because they usually very well are not true. Try to avoid information that shares only the good parts, you know, you get on a, a lot of breed pages and everybody's hitting the, the good is this, the good is this, the good is this, the good is this, but they don't tell you that there's a downside to some of those breeds. Try to avoid Absolutely. information that approaches poultry keeping from an emotional point of view. Chickens aren't people. We don't need to be treating them like people. We need to remember that poultry, first and foremost, is livestock. Try to avoid poultry drama. Absolutely. And you have to sort through that with a grain of salt because you can't go into that drama thing and participate. It's counterproductive. It doesn't help the hobby. It doesn't help the birds. Just keep your distance from all that. Yeah. And at the end of the day, we all have to remind ourselves they are chickens. You know, it's not worth getting emotionally involved or they're getting feeling hurt or starting fights and squabbles Chick chickens aren't worth that because we need to be able to learn from each other help encourage and not fight and squabble that's that's foolish i'm sorry so going well, on from there mandy 
Uh, John, did you have something Does, you doesn't want to move say? forward? Well, I was just saying it doesn't help to move oh. the breed and the hobby no. or the fancy hobby business forward. It's I mean, not for me, helpful it's a at business all. More than a hobby. So you know, having reliable information that you can trust was very difficult for me first and foremost. That's why I reached out to some experts who you know people who knew more than me, people who have been involved in it a lot longer than me, who can go, mm -hmm, yep done that so when you do that this is going to happen and yeah it did let's talk about some resources that people can refer to that we have found helpful to us so john let's start with you what's out there what have you found helpful and what would you encourage other people to look for well, coming from the academic background, I spend a lot of time on ResearchGate and ScienceDirect and places like that, actually looking at peer-reviewed scientific publications. And the industry has put a lot of research and funding into developing birds, and we can ride on a lot of that information. I mean, just because our birds aren't exactly the same, they still have the same physiology and the same needs. So let's take advantage of that wealth of information. And it's out there and it's free. You know, somebody else has already paid for it. And we can trust it, I believe, because they've put millions of dollars into this research, mapping out every second of that bird's life from egg to customer. It's really interesting when the university studies take a look into parasite problems, disease problems, what causes the nutritional deficiencies and what that looks like. There's a lot of really good information that can help you potentially get an idea of what may be going on to your, with your flock if you do encounter problems. And those sources are a lot more helpful than just taking the social media and asking what's wrong with my bird. Because you're going to get an entire assortment of responses that may or may not be helpful and it can be a lot to muddle through. Versus if you have an idea of where to look, you could do more research. And then also a lot of the universities, if they have a veterinary extension, they can help you out more with diagnostics. And you can also reach out to your local agricultural contacts. Every state has a department. And they can help a lot with what's common in your area. What about historical books? Do y'all see any value? in in historical publications absolutely i haven't read as many as i would like to have but that's where the methods were at the beginning of their development especially coming out of the late 1800s and the early 1900s when a lot of varieties were still being developed how they got where they got to can be in those publications Definitely. I think everybody who's serious about breeding needs to have a copy of the Standard of Perfection, the current one. But also, if you can get a hold of it, the, a copy of the year that your breed of choice was admitted, because that's probably going to have the most information on the breed. That's when, you know, everybody sat down around the table and said, OK, this is what makes this bird. And things can fall off along the way as, you know, preferences shift or. They also have a new edition coming out. So what was yes, current? Yes, Reserve Now. Yeah, it's the special 150th edition, and there's probably some breed amendments in there as well, if I've been paying attention to that correctly, where they went in and fixed some errors that were in the prior edition, which is the edition I have. So I'm curious to see what changed. But that brings to the question, do we want to breed to the old standard or the current standard? Or pick a standard and stay with it, I guess. Maybe it depends on which standard suits your flock goals better. Well, <laughs> if you were showing your bird, then you got to go by the most current standard. Okay. Breed standards will change, have changed in the past. They don't change frequently, and it's not an easy thing to get a breed standard changed, but it, it is possible. But I think the most important information we can get out of the standard of perfection. Yes, the breed standard is important, but I think even more important is those first 38, 39 pages of definitions and terms 
you know, what, what are defects, what are disqualifications, how are they described, are some more important than others. It, it's important to have the most current standard because that has the most up-to-date and approved information in it. Um, now, when folks have a variety that's not in the standard, because if I'm thinking of it correctly, there's 53 recognized large fowl varieties in the standard, and then there's some breeds out there that are popular, but they're not in the standard. Right. And and mandolin, I'll I'll use breast as an example because I know you're probably more familiar with breast than some other breeds. But in that case where you you're working with a breed that's not approved, hopefully you have a breed club or a working group established that has created a proposed breed standard describing the birds, what they should look like, what their economical qualities are and so on. So if it's not an approved breed, go to the breed club or, or group that's working with that breed. If there's not a breed club or group working with that breed, for example, you kind of have to find a breeder who's willing to mentor in that situation. Well, oftentimes if they were imported to the U S from other countries, it, it is possible that for many of them, you can go to like, and I forget the one in Europe, but go to the European countries and look for their breed standards that have been approved that, that can guide you. And in many cases they wind up being, and the American standard winds up being very, very close to what they were in the, in the country of origin. For example, in, in Moran's, it, the American standard, you know, you could have read birds to the French standard and the American standard and been successful, you know? The, those two standards are very, very close. Yes, as, as I think they should be. But yeah, there shouldn't be any significant changes to a variety the moment it changes geographical location. They should still be similar. <laughs> yes, I agree. Because that's what attracted us to them to begin with. Well, that's um, why they're standard bred. Maybe that's not because we like the looks of them, but we like the way they perform. Are they productive birds? Moran's get tricky because the UK standard, I believe it calls for a clean leg instead of a lightly feathered shank. It does in some varieties, but not in others. Uh, I know cuckoos in, in England have clean shanks, but I believe, and I may be wrong here, but I believe Black coppers have feathered shanks. Well, that's weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and one time there was a group here in the U.S. that wanted to have feathered shanks and non-feathered shanks of the they same color the variety? variety. Yes. Well, that's not confusing at all. Well, if you stop and think about it in a sense, it's no more confusing that we have single comb white leggings and rose comb white leggings. That's helpful for, for cold when, environments. Yeah. Cold hardiness. Yeah. I, yeah. I can see where yeah. the comb differences would have. Does a the rose comb leghorn have smaller waddles as well? Nope. They should uh, be identical. Every, they time. should be identical in type with the exception of color. That should be the only difference. Well, that kind of I was fascinated going through. Sorry, John. <laughs> I was just thinking waddles in the water when they're drinking in the winter is a bad thing. This is true. But I was just thinking about all of the differences in the varieties when you break that standard open. So the beginning of the book is really useful. Like the first 38 pages is not yes. breed specific. And that is some valuable information. And it doesn't even go into everything. It just kind of lightly touches on some things. And then after the beginning, it breaks down into each individual breed. And then what caught my eye about it is when I started going through the dual purpose varieties, there's a lot of words that are similar in what the frame should be when it describes the bird. And that was really interesting. The commonality is between the, like, it's a, some say that the show type is not performance bred but when you actually get into that breed standard it kind of reads like they're supposed to be well that's exactly right by utility yeah yeah 
you know, breeds and, and particularly American class breeds were created for a specific purpose. And initially that purpose was not exhibition. That purpose was production. And if you enter a hen for a show, you should enter her laying record for the previous six months along with her. Well, they only have so much time to judge. And you can't put so much in there that it slows down the process. Because even getting people together for a two-day show, taking up the whole weekend, there's a lot of logistics in there. So I can understand when things fell off for the sake of But if there was a a spot on the coop card for number of eggs per week late. Yeah, but what's your proof? People could fill in kind of an honor system. Well, there's a, there isn't, but (laughs) I I think poultry people are most, for the most part, honorable. Well, there isn't feather plucking and faking going on. There's a, there's a way to, to kind of work around that. I know Mr. Reese, who was my mentor in Rhode Island Reds, used to have a little, oh, it was probably a four by six piece of heavy cardstock. But he had printed on there the fact that his birds were trap nested and bred for production as well as for their exhibition quality. I wonder what his rate of call is when he's getting more stock for himself. Pretty heavy, I bet. Well, it would have to be. That's something we never talked about. But his birds, he had learned the trick to breeding them to be extremely uniform. I mean, it it was like literally looking at peas in the pod. You could put a group of females together and they all looked the same outwardly. They all had the same shape, the same color, the same hue of color. It, It was unbelievable. And I think that's one of the biggest compliments a breeder can get is consistency. Hey, your bird is extremely uniform, and that that that's a huge compliment. Mm-hmm. So you know his rate of cull was probably far less than my rate of cull with his birds, simply because I put, which is a normal thing, I put selection pressures on different areas based on what I thought the standard said or, or how I interpreted the standard. But to get him there, he had to be extremely selective. Oh, yes. Yes. And, and that's the one thing he hammered at me. He said, when you're starting, you need to be keeping 10% or less of all the chicks you raise to adulthood because it's those high quality chicks that are going to produce your best birds and help move your your flock forward. Mm-hmm. Well, you no, turned he, me on to an excellent book by Ralph Sturgeon that talked about that. And it, it said you want to start your flock, your foundation with the one in a hundred, the truly outstanding specimen that never throws a bad chick. I haven't and found that bird yet in my flock. Pretty close. That, the that book bird can right be there. hard to identify. I can be hard to identify. Yeah. But if you're hatching out hundreds of chicks, you do have a pretty wide genetic pool to be searching yes. from. And it just takes years of training your eye and your hands to get you there. That's the one thing that I like about standard bred poultry is it's always a journey. It has never been a destination. You never get them to the state of perfection that you want. So that drives you to learn more, acquire new skills to improve your birds along the way. I find it ironic that it's called all this action and anybody who breeds birds says there's no such thing as a perfect bird. And there's not. It's just something to aim at. Yeah. It's fun. It's that, <laughs> it's that big, hairy, audacious goal somewhere down the road that we're going to. Sure. But never quite make it. So what other resources can we use to guide us on our journey? I think historical resources for standard bred poultry folks are really important. Because what happened in America is that for many, many years, standard bred poultry were production poultry. They were the ones that hatcheries were using. 
They were the ones that hatcheries were promoting. They were the ones that were on the farms producing eggs and meat uh, for sale that drove a goodly portion of a farmer's income. And then that was the case up until the 1940s when we begin to see the introduction of hybrids, especially in layers, you know, and then ultimately in thanks to the bird of tomorrow contest that was a really driving factor behind creating the Cornish cross. And, and even back then the Cornish cross is not what it is today, but I, I kind of digress there. So if you can find some good historical references, a good place to go is internet site archive, A-R-C-H-I-V-E dot org, archive dot org. And there's some books there I would encourage you to take a look at, to really study. And you can download free PDF copies of these books. That way you can print them out or you can just have them at your beck and call anytime you want to pull them up off your computer. But a good book that has helped me a lot in learning how to use my hands is called The Call of the Hand by Walter Hogan. It will teach you how to use your hands to better evaluate birds' bodies. Because let's face it, what we see is a feather outline. It's not the actual birds' bodies. And birds' bodies are really, really important. If you don't have a good body, you don't have a good skeletal system to support uh, weight. You don't have good body capacity for efficient transfer or efficient uh, digestion of food and, and room for a really good uh, reproductive tract. You don't have a good chicken. But I will say one thing. I, I need to throw a disclaimer in there. Oh, Walter Hogan was a phrenologist by training. And if you don't know what a phrenologist is, is yeah. it's somebody who thought they could predict a person's personality traits, by the way, just by the bumps of their skull. And he he starts out really good in that book, but when he gets over to the part about predicting a bird's ability to lay eggs by feeling the bumps on their noggin, just maybe not. take that part out of the book. <laughs> So, but there is a lot that you can tell about the bird from its skull. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just not how many eggs it's going to lay based on the number of bumps in certain areas. You can see how wide the body's going to be, and that'll sure. help with production. That's right. You, it, you know, wide skulls give you wide bodies, and narrow skulls give you narrow bodies. Have you talked about the eyeball trick yet? I was saving that for later. Well, right, since, we can do that you, later. Since you baited the trap, I'll, I'll fall into it. <laughs> but when you hatch baby chicks, or and this works for whether the baby chicks are, are further down the line, but you can look straight down on the top of their heads. And if you can see the eyeball, they have a narrow head. If you can see a portion of the eyeball, it's a little bit wider head. But if you can't see any eyeball, that's a wide head, which will give you the, the widest body. But it all has to be relative. Up until how to, old is this an accurate indicator? From the day they hatch to the day they die. So I can go out to the flock right now and blow through that entire barn full of all the age groups and sort them by head width. And every single one with a wide head is going to have the matching wide body. I got my handy dandy calipers. <laughs> Amazon right here. We're going to talk about tools in a later episode. And <laughs> something like that, I use my hands and remembering to grab that tool, that'll be tricky, but I'm going to try it. Your hands are always at the end of your arm. You never forget I know. to bring them with That's you. why I look for... <laughs> while we've really digressed here, if you want to improve feather width, measure the width of the primary feathers. The wider I... the primary feathers, pretty much the wider the feathers going to be on the body. Right. Oh, yeah, that would be true. I, I All right, see, back, I, back to the books, though. Back to the books, yes. Uh, another period reference I'd recommend is called Breeding and Mating Poultry by Harry Lamont. And again, you can get that free on, on archive.org. 
throw a little trivia out here, but why, what is Harry Lamont known for rather, other than being a poultry scientist and a, a good poultry writer? Anybody know? I don't know without asking the Google. Got nothing. He created a breed of poultry called Lamongas. L-A-M-O-N-A-S. His name is spelled L-A-M-O-N. I've heard good things about that variety, but they're not common. They're not. They, they were basically extinct at one point, and somebody took the time to go in and recreate the breed. I bet I'd like that person. Now, here's here's a, a bit of trivia about Lamonas. What's different from Lamonas than other American breeds? We're going to conclude part one of educational resources and stop right here. To hear my answer to that question and to get more information and educational resources, be sure to listen to part two next week. So thanks for listening to this episode of the Poultry Keepers podcast. Until next week, may your birds be happy, healthy, and productive. So long.